It's good to be back with all of you again this week. It has become our practice in recent weeks to begin this presentation with our context here at Georgetown as we continue to closely monitor the number of cases we are seeing in our community and among students in our surrounding neighborhoods. Again this week, we have seen higher case counts in our community. We have seen this trend since late January at the beginning of our spring semester. Last week, we made the determination to extend the pause of hybrid undergraduate learning until April 12th, based on the number of cases we are seeing and the timing of spring break for many of our students. It was one year ago, just as we were approaching the spring break period in March 2020, that the worst impacts of COVID-19 began to manifest in the United States. Colleges and universities across our nation were forced to make the difficult decision to transition to virtual learning for the safety of our communities. On March 11, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the novel coronavirus a pandemic. In the weeks prior, since the middle of January 2020, we here at Georgetown had been watching closely the global spread of the virus and had made a number of decisions regarding our students and programs abroad, including our campus and education city, Doha. While much of our time has been focused on COVID-19 here in the United States, we have remained attentive to and aware of the global dimensions of the pandemic. We have watched for emerging trends as other nations saw surging cases, and we have seen the responses that other nations have instituted to address these public health challenges. The global nature of the pandemic is again at the forefront as we think about the spread of new variants of the disease, as well as the process of vaccinating a global population against this virus. Over the past 14 months, we have seen 115 million diagnosed cases of COVID-19 around the world. More than 28 million of those cases have been here in the United States, with India and Brazil following with about 10 million cases each. And then Russia, the United Kingdom, and France, each with around 4 million cases. The downward trend of cases in the United States is being matched with an overall global decline in cases. We have seen some countries, particularly those impacted by the COVID-19 variants, see some serious and significant increases in cases in recent weeks, especially in Brazil, where they are seeing the highest number of COVID-19 deaths since the beginning of the pandemic. So today I'd like to again focus on our global context in three major areas. The status of a global coronavirus response, the equitable distribution of vaccines, and what we've learned over the past year. And I've asked Professor Lawrence Gostin to join me today to share his insights with us on the global aspects of the pandemic. Professor Gostin is a university professor, the founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law, and the faculty director of our O'Neill Institute for National and Global Health Law, a leading center focused on legal, ethical, and global dimensions of health. He serves in many roles in close collaboration with the World Health Organization and it's a pleasure to be able to spend this time with him to share with you some of his thoughts. Well, Larry, to begin, can you provide for us a perspective on what is going on globally as it relates to the COVID-19 pandemic? How would you characterize the response of the international community over the past year to respond to the pandemic? You know, it's really interesting, um, President DeJoy, there, there's so, it's so different in different parts of the world. Um, you know, if you look where the pandemic began in China and then East Asia, um, they've done remarkably well. Um, 
they're nearly back to normal in places like South Korea, Japan, although they've had a little bit of a surge, um, and, uh, and China itself, Singapore has done well. Um, the Pacific Island nations, Australia, New Zealand, I just did a 60 minutes Australia, and I was asking, well, how come you're just like all mingling with no masks? And he said, oh, I forgot you have a pandemic. So they're doing quite, they're doing <laughs> quite well. Um, and, in, and surprisingly so far, Sub-Saharan Africa is doing reasonably well. We don't know for sure why, but it's probably because they were better prepared with their Ebola and AIDS experience, but also they have a much younger population. Um, but then there are parts of the continent like South Africa um, that is really hurting badly. And, and we all know about um, the, uh, the variant of concern that started out in South Africa, um, which is kind of, has a certain amount of resistance um, to vaccines. And then of course, the disaster area, which is the Americas, um, the United States, uh, Latin America, the Caribbean and Europe. Um, and so, you know, I was on the Global Health Security Index, which um, has really ranked countries around the world um, uh, with, from the Obama administration about what was uh, the best prepared countries and counterintuitively um, the better prepared countries like the United States and Europe were among the worst performers. So we're in a mixed bag, but now we're in a whole new situation, of course, with vaccines, which I'm sure you're going to ask about soon or next. <laughs> well, that's exactly where I'd like to go. Last week, uh, we focused our, our presentation on vaccines with a specific focus on the development, approval, and distribution of vaccines here in the United States. Can you share with us what, what is happening globally in vaccine distribution? Yeah, well, first of all, just a, you know, a quick primer, which most people will know anyway. Um, just last week, the US FDA approved a third vaccine through an emergency use authorization, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And then we already had two highly effective um, uh, messenger RNA vaccines from Pfizer uh, and Moderna. Um, and globally, um, we've got vaccines from Russia, it's Sputnik V vaccine, uh, a couple from China and India. Um, and so we've got proliferating um, vaccines with very variable of, uh, efficacy around the world. The problem is, um, as Emmanuel Macron said, uh, president of France, we're in a two-speed world. And the Minister of Justice from South Africa put it rather more bluntly. And he said, it's a vaccine apartheid. And what they both meant was that it's very likely that um, by the end of this calendar year, Jack, um, the United States, uh, Europe, uh, the UK, um, and, uh, and probably um, several high performing countries in Asia, as well as Israel and the Ar uh, United Arab Emirates will have completely uh, gotten control over this. It won't be over, um, but there will, will be approaching herd immunity and we'll be in a much better place. We can talk about when I think things will be back to normal, but, but, but the, the richer economies are going to be really rebounding robustly um, by the end of the year. Whereas in um, many parts of the world, most parts of the world in low and middle income countries, that won't happen until the end of 2022 or even three or four is sometimes five years later. And that's a huge problem um, for equity. Um, Dr. Tedros, the head of WHO, I think appropriately called it a catastrophic global moral failure, which I agree with. Um, and, but beyond that, I think it's not in the United States national interests to have uh, COVID-19 raging in other parts of the world because that will create more variants with more resistance uh, to vaccines and they will recede themselves in the United States. So no one is safe until everyone is safe in my view. Let's take this just a little bit deeper and, and discuss the importance for us 
here in the United States to pay attention to the global pandemic response? What impact does the international arena have on our response here in the United States? Yeah, I mean, the, the International Chamber of Commerce uh, pointed out that so long as we leave most of the world unvaccinated, that we'll have you know, over a $10 trillion loss of global GDP. And more than half of that loss will be in the United States and Europe. Um, so from our economic perspective, it's very much in our economic interests to ensure worldwide vaccination because of supply chains, trading, commerce. One could also add you know, political uh, instability. And to that is the public health justification that I, that I just mentioned, Jack, which is you know, the fact that I hear too often in the United States, well, we have to mask up and distance and vaccinate um, to prevent variants. And of course, I agree with that you know, from the bottom of my heart. We all should do it. And, and, and you're doing a fantastic job at Georgetown University with our community. Um, but the truth is, is that germs don't respect borders and variants are not gonna stop just because we stop COVID in the United States. They'll continue to circulate the more infection there is globally. And that will absolutely come back to our shores. We've seen that time and time again from when we saw the very first wave of COVID from China to East Asia to Europe to the United States. And we've seen it with the variants. We now have what will probably be the predominant variant, the UK variant in the United States. We're seeing the Brazilian and the South African variants in the United States. These things, we are a global community and we just can't get away from it as much as we might try. What can we do in the United States to help contribute to a global response? Well, you know, I'm working, you know, with the White House and and uh, also very closely with WHO because, as you know, um, uh, the O'Neill Institute at Georgetown Law Center is um, is the only WHO collaborating center on on global health law. So we work closely with them. So what can we do? Um, uh, President Biden's already taken two meaningful steps. Um, he's uh, uh, recommitted himself to the World Health Organization, and he's joined COVAX. COVAX is a facility um, that's led by WHO, the Gavi Alliance, and CEPI um, to provide equitable and affordable uh, vaccines uh, in lower income countries. Um, and so what we can do is provide full funding um, for uh, COVAX, um, but also and this is really hard to say for an American, we actually have to donate some of our doses um, as uh, actually France is doing now um, to uh, COVAX. Um, I know it hurts because we're all hurting in America. And when I just did a BBC interview uh, and you know, for them, I tried to explain the US position and said, you know, listen, you, you have no idea how America, America and Americans have suffered um, through this. And, you know, and, and so we're, we tend to be thinking inwardly and it's understandable, but we really have to um, go to our better angels and uh, provide the kind of uh, humanitarian assistance, including vaccines uh, that are so badly needed around the world. You know, I said um, uh, recently to the National Academy of Sciences here that, you know, America has lost our way. We've lost our moral voice. You know, we were the country that virtually um, prevented a catastrophe in Africa over a of the AIDS pandemic with PEPFAR, our support of the Global Fund. Um, you know, there's so much for us to be proud of in our history. But now we're so self-obsessed that we can't think outside our borders, but we have to. And I, I, do, I do know uh, that President Biden is, is, an, is a humanitarian and an internationalist. And we, we are trying to nudge the administration in the right direction. I know you work closely with the WHO, the World Health Organization. 
what, what are some of the other issues that the WHO is confronting in this moment? Boy, it's, you know, it, it's a cataclysmic uh, year and moment for WHO. And it started out um, with uh, China really not being fully transparent and honest about uh, the, the, pet, the, the outbreak when it arose and WHO uh, re reiterating the Chinese report. And so it got caught in a battle and a geostrategic struggle between the two world's superpowers, the United States and China. And that harmed it a lot. Most recently, as you may know, and I'm sure the people listening in will know that uh, WHO sent an independent group of experts to Wuhan to try to find the origins of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and they did an interim, they did a press conference which was criticized uh, and they were supposed to do an interim report. I've just heard from WHO that they may not issue the interim report and go directly to the, to the actual report because they're under such fire. And I have to say, you know, I know Dr. Tedros extraordinarily well. Um, we talk on the phone a lot and he is a man of extraordinary leadership and compassion. He cares a lot. He, he was on the ground in Ebola. On my smartphone, I have a video of uh, WHO health workers in, in Africa uh, being uh, under, uh, under fire under armed fire and risking their lives. And he's done that with COVID as well. Sure, WHO has made mistakes, but you know, we desperately need them now. And I think it's unconscionable for the world to, to mire them in, 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 in political issues when they really need to be focusing on all of us together in this pandemic. It seems as though countries around the world are experiencing COVID in different ways. Some yeah. countries, some countries will face surges at one time while others see a decline. Some countries apply certain public health strategies while others are taking different approaches. What can we learn from these different responses? Yeah, there's a lot of ongoing um, scholarly uh, thought around those very issues. They're ex extraordinarily important, not just for COVID and this pandemic, but for future pandemics as we know that there will be. Um, so what have we learned? I mean, we learn um, that you lead with science. I, I did a JAMA article called The Great Coronavirus Pandemic of 2020. What are the lessons learned? And I started with that. You have to start with science. Um, and you have to understand that in a global health emergency, the science will evolve. We don't know everything. and We have to just make our best judgment based upon the best available evidence. And so um, the countries that have done well have, uh, first of all, uh, universally masked and universally distanced. Um, they have, um, their governments have been very rapid, uh, as, the, as the Prime Minister of New Zealand said, she said, you know, you, you've got to hit it early, you've got to hit it hard. And that's countries like Taiwan, um, South Korea um, did that extraordinarily well, as did Australia and, the, and, and more so New Zealand. Um, so uh, th those, are the, those are the lessons. And then you've got to have a public health infrastructure that has the capacity and the surge capacity for mass testing, contact tracing. Many countries have used digital um, uh, apps on the cell phones to help with mass contact tracing. And, and the public has, has accepted a science-led approach. Um, the countries that have done worse, like you know, Brazil, the United States, Europe, um, ha have um, often not abided by these kinds of standard public health guidelines like masking and, and distancing uh, for a whole lot of cultural and, and, and normative reasons. Um, but I think that those were the le those are the chief lessons learned: a resilient health system, following science, and a public that understands that we're all in this together. We can't say anymore that this is my right. We also have to say, well, what is my 
um, ethical obligation to my neighbor, to my family, to my community, to my country, to my world, um, which is very much the Jesuit tradition at Georgetown, which is why I love it here so much. I can't thank you enough for sharing your reflections with us, Larry. Are there, are there other issues on your mind as we think about the global pandemic? You know, I'll only say this, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a dreadful time and, you know, and we're still, we're still in the midst of it and there's a lot of doomsayers even still, but history tells us with all the pandemics um, that they tend to have a two to three year trajectory and we've had literally warp speed on vaccines. They're extraordinarily good. We are going to come out of it. And there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's just been a very long tunnel. And for the international community, the, lo the, the lower income community, the tunnel is even longer and we need to provide some light for them and hope. Larry, thank you for your exceptional leadership throughout this past year and for your many years here at Georgetown. It's an honor to be able to spend this time with you. It's my honor, Jack. Thank you very much. You take care. Bye. Thank you all again for being with us, and I look forward to being together again next week. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you. For every Hoya, everywhere. <laughs>